Sebastian, Jesse, Lee Ackley, a pleasure to meet you. Hi, Lee, how are you? Really good, really good. Um, let's go back. You're both Toronto born. I presume you went to school in Toronto. Mm. Where did you do all of that? I was born and grew up in Mississauga. Um, <laughs> so not, not Toronto at all. Okay. I mean, close enough, but yeah, GTA, but, uh, well, actually not even GTA. It's, it's out of the parameter. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's out of the, it's not part of the mega city. I'll say that. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I was, I was actually, uh, living in LA for eight years and I moved back in the summer and, uh, the neighborhood I was staying in my mother-in-law's neighborhood is a stone throw from the hospital I was born in. I was like okay. trying to get my Canadian finances back and running. And I was at a CIBC bank, get trying to apply for a credit card that I couldn't get. And I was right across the street from the hospital I was born in. I'm like, do you realize I was born right here? They're like, I don't care. You've got you got terrible it, Canadian I credit. Did you say it in that voice? Yeah, I said it in that, in Ben Gazzara's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Do uh, you realize where I was born? <laughs> yeah, I was born at Sherborne in Wellesley, and uh, that hospital doesn't exist anymore. And then I lived all over Toronto, but always kind of leaning on the, on the east. And that's also funny because East York was the last part of Toronto to become part of Toronto. We yeah. maintained our borough status for a long time. And actually just behind me, I have the flag from the East York City Hall that my cousin stole before amalgamation. So uh, we have evidence and our band used to take it around on tour. And there's actually footage of us playing in Tokyo and Osaka with yeah. the East York City Hall flag <laughs> on one of my amps. Uh, and that's we were also, when we were on Conan O'Brien, he announced us as from the from the borough of East York, because <laughs> that's kind of how we identified as a band when we started. We start on the east side of Toronto. Now, uh, incidentally, Jesse lives two hours east of Toronto. Okay. I live two hours west of Toronto. Okay, but yeah. uh, thanks to modern technology, you can pull it together. Yeah. Where are you? Like this. Where are you? I'm in Oshawa right now. Right off of Simcoe, uh, Simcoe Street there? Yeah, we're west of Simcoe Street. We're on Taunton Road at Oshawa Airport. Have you ever been out to Oshawa Airport? I went to Durham College for one semester and I actually had a radio show for one day and I didn't realize that I needed to play uh, uh, versions of rap songs that didn't have swearing in them. And I got pulled after about 40 minutes and uh, never did it again. What did you study at Durham College? Uh, I didn't really study anything. My grade point average after one semester was 0 0.2. Uh, I studied, I studied, um, well, I was in the journalism program, but I took it really to use the photo lab. And I actually did the, I did all the art for um, a seven inch by this band from California called The Locust um, in that school. And there was actually, I took a really great photograph of my dad that was in a frame uh, that was on the wall in that hallway at Durham. And I should have, I should have tried to get that back. I would like to have that photo. It was like him playing at the opera house. And, and you know, it's funny you mentioned the hospital that you were born in because I just had a flashback. You can't see it, but I took six stitches right here because I took a puck in the mouth back in the day. And uh, that's that a euphemism, right? That was the <laughs> hospital I went to to get stitched up. Sorry? That's a euphemism, right? Took a puck in the mouth? Uh, no, it's not a euphemism. It literally took a puck in the mouth. Uh, now we're going to get banned from the. I'm going to get banned from the radio again. So that's <laughs> cool, man. I can't believe they had you playlisted at a college radio station. I thought they'd just let you fly with it. <laughs> no, they left. Uh, I think it was like pretty much brand new at the time. I I really didn't know what I was doing. So well, that's okay. I had, I had the records. Yeah, yeah. Music people tend to be uh, a little bit. Uh, more on the geekier side, a little more inward. When you were growing up, did you um, were you confined to the music room, or did you take your activities to rinks and football fields and stuff? I was a hundred percent a geek nerd person. I had like five people that maybe five people that I would actually call friends. Then uh, 
I kept to myself. I was not, I was, I mean, now, now that I'm an, a grown man with a family, I feel very comfortable talking about this stuff, but at the time I wouldn't have been. Like I was basically just celibate and married to my guitar and drums. Like that's what I was interested in. I cared about skateboarding and music and that was basically it. Like I liked girls, but I liked girls like like Vincent Gallo, like girls in Buffalo 66. Like I just kind of, kind of one at a time. And <laughs> I, you know. But also uh, don't touch me. <laughs> don't yeah, touch me. that was, that was part of it too. Like I just, I just kept to myself and was really only concerned about, about being creative. That was it. And I think skateboarding, especially out in that part of, uh, like I lived in uh, Pickering for six, seven, six or seven years. Like my family gradually moved more east, uh, you know, because, well, we were poor. <laughs> and so we wanted to, you know, the best place you could live. You know, we went from Toronto to Scarborough to Pickering. Um, Where in Pickering? Because I lived there for 13 years. Uh, I went to uh, I went to Pine Ridge for two and a half years, and I so lived, did my son. And I lived about uh, I lived about a one cigarette walk away from the parking lot. Okay, uh, so we, we come from the same neighborhood, kind of. Is it still is it still called Crime Ridge? It wasn't Crime Ridge then, although oh. it was. Uh, it was definitely crime. It was changing. Was <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think when I moved there, the, the school hadn't even been built yet. And my son spent a couple of years there. So I lived at Liverpool and Finch. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, that's I, I, I would be around there all the time. I mean, while I went to that school, my friends found a dead body in a cardboard box behind the school. So like we it was a it was a it was a good time. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, no, like all I cared about was just being creative. And, you know, when you're, I think there's a, there's a real benefit to growing up outside of the city where entertainment is sort of like at your door all the time when, and both of Sebastian and I have this in common, but him from the West, like you have to be, you have to entertain yourself and you have your options. I mean, you either go a, a bad way or you put that energy into something more positive for yourself and that I think that spawns a lot of creativity you know, also in the suburbs there's space uh there's generally more space and both Jesse and I are drummers so being a drummer you know you need uh you need to be at least a few feet away from somebody you know I, I lived, grew up in a semi-detached house so when I played drums, I was always annoying somebody. I was always irritating somebody. Um, but my my story uh, creatively is very similar to Jesse's, except minus the skateboarding and dead bodies. <laughs> What's it like having two drummers in the band? Is, well, I mean, is, on, is that an extra voice that you need, Sebastian? <laughs> on this record, this is the first Death Room Bub record where Jesse played drums. Actually, I think he played a little bit of drums on an incidental track on the first record. Jesse played drums on the song Mean Streets on this record. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, Jesse, can I ask you about your father? I heard he played in an early incarnation of Steppenwolf. Did I get that right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, who was your dad? My dad, my dad's name was Fred Keeler. He was in a band called David Clayton Thomas and the Shays, and David right. Clayton Thomas obviously went on to be uh, the singer in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And when my dad was a teenager, he was in the that was they were the first Canadian band to ever play on American television, and you can watch that on YouTube. It's quite hilarious because the Americans set up the stage like a hockey rink for them, like it had to be <laughs> it had to be so Canadian. Yeah. And you can tell how uncomfortable my dad was. Um, but wasn't he, Paul Anka the host? Uh, I don't know, but I know he played like he played with everybody. Uh, you know, there's I, I don't have evidence of it, but I've been told that he he played with Rick James for a little bit. I know that he played uh, with Parliament for a little while. I mean, he played with everybody. Um, you can watch him in the Blues Brothers sequel in the church scene. Um, and we were very like. I guess, you know, still to this day, it's all very mixed up. It's not like there's that many uh, musicians of that era that don't seem to know each other. Yeah, my dad yeah. was like, I have a record here in the house that Garth Hudson gave my dad at Robbie Robertson's mom's house. 
just south of the Danforth on off of Jones Avenue. Uh, I have it like it's here. <laughs> um, that, that, you know, that's the world that that he was in. I'm getting the uh, the two minute warning, so I'm going to have to cut to the chase a little bit as much as I'd like to go on a little bit longer with you guys. Um, the new album still has some of your fiery fiery rhetoric, I would say, but at the same time, it's uh, it's pretty sentimental, and it starts with the title of the album. Mm -hmm. What changed in the last few years? Um, I would say it's. Uh... Well, what changed is that we, we were able to look back at our band in a, uh, not that we look back very, uh, very often, but um, we've realized that this is our life's work, you know, which is a strange thing to realize. Uh, we've been doing it for 20 years. Um, and when we started the process of making this record, uh, I was kind of digging around in the archives. I, my record label re-released our first EP, Heads Up. And so I was listening to those old four track recordings, the demos and all these things. And I kind of, we kind of cast a spell on the band um, and kind of re-infused it with that early energy by going back and listening to those, those very first recordings. And actually we toured the Heads Up EP uh, in 2019. And so um, I was very much in this mode of uh, like the proto death from above mode. And the, and the very first songs we wrote were about our friends and our girlfriends and our families. Um, the first LP talks a lot about my family and the relationships I was in at the time. Um, and so the themes on that record explore a, a small life. It was before we'd seen the world um, and maybe even before I had an opinion on the world. And then when we got back together, the physical world and outrages now, um, although there, those themes do exist on there, um, the general theme is that of looking outward. And this record, um, I'm not sure why, uh, I think maybe for the reasons I just outlined, but it was it was more just looking looking inward again and looking at the life around um, and trying to get specific. And I think that the the more specific you get, um, somehow those themes become more universal to me. I don't know if I want to always talk about the world at large. It's exhausting and impossible to actually describe. But if you can describe a small moment that might be more profound um, and, and maybe more relatable. I don't know. <laughs> Certainly more, a more practical task to try to, to, you know, and I think that with time you, uh, and with age, you learn that uh, the, the, the best thing you can do is the thing that you can do, you know, mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, constantly sort of imagining or being led by uh, sort of like utopian concepts. Like there's, everyone has those grand ideas, you know, the, the worst question, it's, I put it on at par with the, if I had a time machine, but it's like, if I was the president or whatever, like that type of nonsense, people that think- means something totally different now, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> but people think, people think and have these sort of like, ideals that are so far beyond like oh if I had a time machine I would go and do this and that it's like or you have the body that you're living in currently and you have yeah. the arms that are attached to that body that reach x amount out and you can do something within that grasp and start thinking about what you can do and what you can actually touch I'm, I'm really talking with my hands here I'm sorry <laughs> like past the computer and just like arms out um you know, and when you figure out that that's, that's uh, far more fulfilling and you can actually see the results of what you're doing. And uh, also really, really difficult already. You know, like yeah. my hands, you can't see them on the radio, but I've been, I've been building a house for my family. You know, we bought an old house and I've been fixing everything and it's, it's uh, impossible to do. It's, it's, there's always something. Every time you touch something, something else has to happen. So even when you're trying to fix your own life, it's almost impossible. 
you know? So you have to at least start with that. Imagine trying to extrapolate that across society. <laughs> it's like, but if everybody did dynamic. that, if everyone was trying to do the best they could with, you know, the, within the reach that they have, it would end up actually mm -hmm. accomplishing the, the grand utopian ideas that I think we, uh, we, we probably all have, you know, but, you know, that's not something I know that's not the most exciting thing to hear if you're uh, a young person, but um, it's the truth. And someday you'll think about this interview and be like, God damn, death from above was right. <laughs> you know, I know you guys had um, uh, a rancorous time there for five years. You got it back together and you're both sitting in separate rooms right now, far apart, but I can feel the chemistry amongst you. And I think it's a really remarkable thing. And I think that, uh, and, and, I, and I applaud you for doing it and, uh, and best wishes to, to both you and Jess, uh, uh, Jesse and Sebastian it is uh, really Thank nice you. connecting with you. Hope we can do it uh, a little deeper next time. Let's do it. And maybe in studio. That would be awesome.